pray for our nation. And uh, we're uh, living in some interesting times. Uh, things are, uh, I think, from at least my perspective, uh, picking up steam uh, as we go downhill. And uh, uh, things are not slowing down uh, morally, politically, or any other way. And uh, we are, uh, I, I think, heading for uh, really what the Bible predicts, a, uh, a world that is ripe for an antichrist, for a leader who will stand up and say, I've got the answers for all of your problems. Bow down and worship me. And that's exactly what's going to happen uh, at the midpoint of the tribulation uh, time period. Um, what is restraining that man of sin uh, right now? It's the Holy Spirit. But when the rapture of the church takes place, there is not going to be anything that is going to restrain that man of sin from stepping to the forefront. And so um, uh, the, uh, you can be thankful that the Antichrist will not take the throne as long as the church is here. But at the same time, um, let's look forward to the coming of the Lord because he indeed uh, is coming uh, soon. Uh, if you would open your Bibles to 2 Timothy uh, chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. And as we think of uh, uh, this particular passage of scripture. So if you have a study Bible, it's probably called a, an encouragement to endure. Uh, and Timothy, as a young pastor, uh, needed to have a mindset that would help him get through the trials and troubles uh, that would face him. Beginning in uh, verse 6, wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. And I might just uh, comment that little word partaker there uh, means to have communion with. It means to have fellowship with. And uh, that word partaker is used in uh, uh, several passages uh, in, the, uh, in the New Testament, including the one we'll be looking at in 1 Peter. Be thou a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, whereunto, I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Let's, uh, let's pause for prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we want to, again, thank you for your grace. We thank you that you have, through the gospel, brought life and light into a dark world. And as we understand what Timothy and Paul are talking about, that when we identify and relate and preach the gospel, that it is going to gender up opposition and create suffering. We pray that as we suffer for the cause of Christ, that it would be looked upon as a blessing to your glory, that it would be looked upon as a way to uh, fellowship uh, and be a partaker with you as we uh, look at all that you've done and gone through just to provide us 
uh, your salvation. We, we thank you uh, for that. We want to uh, remember uh, those on our prayer list, and uh, uh, we commit each one to you. We thank you for uh, the success that uh, uh, some have had and, and, uh, and the success that some are looking forward to. Uh, we just pray that uh, uh, in your grace, uh, you could give people the, the mental courage uh, and, uh, to go on and face life each day and be the testimony uh, to the grace of God that you would have uh, each of us be. And so we uh, uh, just commit this to you. Um, uh, we also want to remember our country. We thank you for it. We thank you for the freedoms uh, that we have. We thank you for uh, those men in the past, uh, particularly our forefathers, uh, who uh, gave us a document that guarantees uh, our freedom. And we just uh, pray that in your grace that you could stop and slow down those who want to uh, take those guarantees away. Uh, we just uh, pray that uh, in your grace uh, you could undertake for this, uh, this great nation. And uh, as we think of uh, being citizens, uh, that while we still have liberties, that we would live our lives in such a way that glory could be brought to the very grace of God and that we could be responsible uh, citizens and set a good example, not only uh, for our families, but also in the communities that we live in, regardless of the opposition that might, might come uh, our way. And so we, we thank you uh, for this great uh, country. We want to just remember uh, our brothers and sisters in the Lord around the world who are suffering greatly and even dying for the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, we pray that your grace would uh, sustain them. We just pray that uh, we could be encouraged by their courage as they face trouble that we've uh, really know nothing about. And we just pray that uh, as we uh, think about the trouble that could come, that we'd realize that uh, there is no guarantees that trouble could come to Christians anywhere <laughs> in this world. And so we, we uh, thank you. We thank you for this morning. We uh, just pray that the service and the time spent together would be uh, uh, profitable and that uh, we'd be spiritually better for it, for meeting this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
let's uh, open our Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. And uh, we'll try to finish this chapter this morning in verses uh, 12 through uh, 19. And as we uh, just think of where we have been in this particular uh, chapter, uh, Peter is giving these churches some encouragement. And uh, it's based on the imminent return of Jesus Christ. And as you, uh, uh, what he's talking about is in these last days, um, Jesus Christ is going to return. And in the light of his return, the troubles and trials that we face, uh, we can handle emotionally and mentally. And so if you recall, uh, based on this eminent return, uh, last week we saw that we should be of sound mind. Uh, and we should watch unto prayer. And I, uh, if you recall, uh, being of sound mind leads us to good prayer. That's the idea in this particular uh, uh, verses that we read. Uh, watch unto prayer. And, uh, uh, and this is uh, in verse uh, 7. But the end of all things is at hand. It's imminent. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. If you don't have a sober mind, and the idea here is not, you know, uh, being drunk with alcohol versus not drinking. The idea here of sober is to, uh, the opposite would be to be all flustered, uh, to uh, just be out of sorts, uh, panic, uh, living in panic city or what, uh, however you want to describe it. And when that's the case, it negatively affects our prayer life. We can't pray like we should pray if we don't have a sound mind. He then uh, says this, and it's important to note that um, uh, he says, And above all things, have fervent charity uh, among yourselves. And last week we took some time to look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, where uh, the gifts are being discussed in chapters 12 and 14. And he says, without love, all of the gifts, all of the service that you do, uh, all you become is, uh, is just a noisemaker. And there is no profit behind it. And so love becomes uh, that... Uh, that motivating factor. And as we stop and we think of love, uh, the most popular verse in the Bible, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now think about this. What if God didn't love you? And Jesus Christ came and died on the cross anyway. Um, there would be uh, something about that that would do what? Uh, that would just zap the strength out of what Jesus Christ did for us. He was motivated because of his love towards us. And that love uh, caused him uh, to be willing to die on the cross and pay the penalty of sin. So I think it would be safe to say that if uh, he didn't love us, he uh, probably would have had second thoughts about going to the cross and dying for us. And... Uh, uh, and here, Peter is admonishing the church, reminding the church that the things that you do, if, uh, if, it, if it isn't covered with love, um, then uh, there is trouble. And it says, uh, love covers a multitude of sins. And what we noted uh, in that verse is this, is that uh, covering a multitude of sins doesn't mean that you sweep sin under the carpet. Uh, what it means is, and the idea is, is you don't broadcast it. Uh, there is no uh, uh, point in broadcasting a person's sin. Uh, can we recognize it? Can we call it sin? We certainly can. But the fact of the matter is, is that uh, we all have sins in our lives. And it is not uplifting to sit around and point to other people's sins. If you want to do that, uh, you could literally have an endless job because we're all just, we're all a bunch of losers, all right? And it's easy 
to pick out the weaknesses in other people or their sins. And as we uh, 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 think about that, um, what we need to do is to encourage each other in the love of God and what he has provided, his grace. It says, use hospitality uh, without complaining. And, uh, and as we think of being hospitable, uh, the idea of, of sharing with others, uh, and not just our things, but our time, um, uh, uh, whatever we can share. Uh, we should not grumble and gripe when, uh, when that happens. And uh, uh, if you're anything like me, there are times when uh, I, I just like to be left alone. Is, it, is anybody else like that? Just leave me alone. And, uh, um, but uh, uh, by the grace of God, uh, we can understand that we're actually here uh, for other people. You know, Jesus Christ didn't come to earth to uh, benefit himself. He had no benefit in leaving heaven and coming to earth as a servant. No benefit to him at all. Uh, he didn't have any sin that he needed to die for. He came to earth, put himself out for our benefit. And as we stop and we think of, uh, why are you here? Why am I here? And if we're not here to benefit others, uh, and uh, people aren't better off because you're around, uh, then uh, maybe we should do some, uh, some soul searching is, uh, is the point. Well, as we go on, he talks about uh, spiritual gifts. And uh, uh, spiritual gifts, as we noted, the word gifts is that word charisma, uh, which uh, literally is where we get the word grace. And the gifts that we have are given to each of us not because we deserve it. And that's very important to understand about grace. Grace is God doing us a favor. Uh, not because we've earned it. Not because we've, uh, you, know, uh, you know, got enough brownie points stored up with God that he's going to bless us some way. Grace is God giving us what we don't deserve to have. And that includes our gifts uh, that we use. And so, what should our attitude be about gifts of grace? From our salvation, which is called a gift of God, uh, to the gifts that we use to uh, encourage others. Uh, the response should be, thank you, thank you. And that's what God wants from us, is he wants thanks. Uh, as we think of the word thanks and thanksgiving that's used in the Bible. Uh, it's a very popular concept of giving thanks uh, to God and for what he has provided for us. And so as we uh, finished up that particular passage, it says uh, in verse, uh, verse 11, If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. And the oracles of God is, is actually pointing to the written word of God. Uh, it's the word of God that we need to share and uh, make comment about. If any man minister, uh, let him do it as the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And so as we just stop and we think of... Um, really why we're here. Uh, we're here to bring glory to God. That's our purpose. And, uh, and everything that we do should have that uh, motivating uh, factor. And as we look at the imminent return of Jesus Christ, he could come back today. I know I said that last week, uh, but he, he could. He could come today. He could come next week. Uh, and as we think of the return of Jesus Christ, we are told, and we looked up uh, several verses last week on uh, both Peter and Paul and James. Uh, they all said, 
look forward to the return of Jesus Christ. This is what we're anticipating uh, that will happen. Well, as we uh, move on in this particular chapter, in verse 12, uh, Peter brings us back to trials and suffering that we go through. And he says this in the beginning of verse 12. He says, Beloved. Now, when you see a term like brethren or beloved, uh, who's he talking to? He's not talking to the world at large. He is talking to God's children. He is talking to those who have been born again, those who are saved, those who have trusted in the finished work of Jesus Christ for their salvation. And they're trusting it in it alone. Uh, they're not adding anything to it. And so uh, he's talking to Christians. If you're here and you're, saved, uh, and you're saved, listen up. This is for you. If you're here and you're not saved, then uh, you can trust Jesus Christ for your salvation right now, right where you sit. And you can become a child of God. You don't have to wait till the end of the message. You can trust him right where you're at. It's with the heart man believes unto righteousness. If you do that right now, then for the rest of the service, you would be classified as a beloved one. So listen up and, uh, uh, and hear what Peter has to uh, say. And he says this, Beloved, think it not strange Concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. And so the attitude or mindset of the world, and this is uh, an important concept to get, is very contrary to Jesus Christ and his righteousness. Uh, the world at large, uh, it is at loggerheads, you might say with the righteousness of God. Uh, Satan, who is the God of this world. Uh, Jesus tells uh, people in John chapter 8, you are of your father, the devil. And as we think of, of Satan and God himself, they are at loggerheads. Their um, uh, vision, their purposes uh, contradict each other. And Satan, I might just say, uh, his tactic in getting people to follow him is to lie to them. And uh, I, I might just say that when Jesus says, it's the truth that will set you free. And I, I, I know I've said this before, but I'll say it again. Um, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He that hath the Son shall indeed be free. But as we think of truth, there's a principle. And that principle is this. And uh, uh, if I was uh, going to give a little premarital counseling, uh, which uh, I've, I've had to do lately, all right, um, uh, this is one point I would bring out, that to truly have a free marriage... And what I mean is, a functioning marriage, uh, you need to deal honestly with each other. If you're going to lie uh, to each other, then uh, things are not going to work out the way they should. Are you with me on that? Um, the, uh, uh, our politicians, if our politicians lie to us, and whether we believe people or not, we are headed towards slavery. If the news people lie to us, and uh, whether we believe it or not, uh, what's happening? When truth is suppressed, bondage increases. It's just the way it is. And so it's, it's important, and as we noted on our uh, Fourth of July message, um, uh, the freedom of the press, the freedom to speak, uh, Assumed in all that is that we're seeking the truth in speaking what is right and honest and true. Are you with me on that? And, uh, and that's the way 
uh, people become free in all your relationships. If, if you uh, work for a, uh, uh, a boss or a business that is dishonest, what do you find? You find that people are not free to grow. There's things that are going on that, that actually are hurting uh, the business. Uh, churches, the same way. Uh, we should be honest and open. And it's the truth that will uh, free people uh, to be what they ought to be. And so uh, keep that uh, in mind. And Jesus Christ uh, is, uh, uh, comes into the world and he brings light into a dark world. And there is a conflict that is there. And uh, uh, is, uh, uh, just a little side note here on, uh, on a little Bible study. It's interesting on the uh, uh, if, and uh, it, it's, we, we see that little word if right here uh, that, that's used, uh, beloved, think it not strange that the fiery trial which is to uh, try you is though some strange thing happen. But if we uh, look back at chapter 3, verse 14, uh, it says this, But, and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror. And if you did a word study on this, and I don't expect most of us to do this all the time, but uh, you know, the ifs have different classes. And one of the uh, lexicons, or uh, what's a lexicon? That's a... Uh, Lexicon. It's a three-syllable word for dictionary. Okay, um, it's a dictionary. Um, they uh, they use the fourth class uh, if, uh, and they use First Peter chapter three verse fourteen as the example of the the clearest example of the fourth class if in the Bible. So your question is, what is the fourth class if? And the fourth class if is this: uh, if this happens but it probably won't. But if it does, but it's, it's, it's unlikely that it will happen, but if it does, here's how I, we want you to react and, uh, uh, and our reaction to it. And in 1 Peter 3.14, it says, you probably won't suffer. That's what it says. Then we turn over to uh, chapter 4, verse 12, and Peter says, think it not strange. In other words, it's normal that we uh, uh, are going to suffer. And so uh, how do we reconcile those two, two thoughts? And I'll, I'll tell you this. Not too many people have thought about that, but it kind of, kind of bugs me a little bit. How do we do that? And... Here's the conclusion that I've come up to, come up with. In 1 Peter chapter 3, he is talking about suffering in the flesh. He is talking about being martyred. He is talking about being uh, whipped. And, and while it is true that under Nero, uh, there were Christians that were martyred for the faith, for the most part, that didn't happen to the majority of Christians. And so, 1 Peter chapter 3, I could say, you know what? If you are going to be martyred for Jesus Christ, you're going to die. You're going to burn at the stake for Jesus Christ. Here's how you should react to that. But I'm going to tell you this. Most of us here will probably not be burned at the stake. Are you with me? Most of us here will not be put on a firing line and shot or hung because of our faith in Jesus Christ. But we go to chapter 4, and we have a different type of suffering right here. Uh, 3.14, not many will suffer. But chapter 4, verse 12, refers to a reproach type of suffering. In other words, the world is going to think ill of you. The world is going to think you're weird. The world is going to uh, 
just think you're, 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 you're nuts. And they don't understand you at all. Look back at chapter 4, verse 4. And we read, Wherein they think it's strange that you run not with them. They think it's strange in their same excess of riot, and then they do something else. They speak evil of you. Now, we've all heard that little saying our mothers taught us. What did they teach us? Sticks and stones will break your bones, but words will never hurt you. Well, that's not totally true. Oftentimes, words can hurt. And sometimes, uh, some of the worst hurt that you have is what people have said about you. And so, while it's true, it might not leave bruises on the outside, and I don't know about you guys, but I would, uh, I would have rather have gotten a, a good old-fashioned spanking and had it over with than to have to go sit in my room for a while. I, I don't like that. Or get chewed out. I don't, want, I don't like that. So just... Give me a good whack and get it over with, and I'll take it. Um, anybody else like that? I don't know. <laughs> but um, the, uh, uh, the world thinks it's strange. They think you're strange. That's the point right here. What's wrong with you? And, uh, and their tendency is, is to wilt under those circumstances. And I think if you think about it, that's exactly the way it is. Uh, peer pressure is a very big deal. And, uh, and we're all subject to that. And, uh, uh, and the older you get, it doesn't really seem to uh, go away, does it? Uh, you know, we used to laugh when people turn 40 or if they're in their 50s and some of you people have turned 70. You don't care what people think anymore. You just blurt it out. Is that, is that true? Partially, only partially true. Um, the, uh, what, what, what did I, I read? I, I think I mentioned this before. This, uh, this lady that turned, I don't know, 109 or something like that, and she still was of sound mind. And uh, they asked her, well, what, what's it like uh, living this long? And she says, well, I don't have any more peer pressure. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, so I guess if you outlive everybody else, uh, you probably uh, can, can, can escape that little problem. But in the meantime, um, uh, verse uh, 7, or verse 4, excuse me, of chapter 4 is a, is a big deal. And it can hurt, and it can cause uh, pain. And so to verse 12, what is uh, Peter saying? Uh, he's saying this, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happens unto you. And I should just say that all believers who identify with Christ will partake in this type of suffering. Uh, it, it is unavoidable. And so let's make some observations here in, on this particular passage and the first thing we note is this, that it's a normal part of the Christian life. Uh, when I put that down, I thought, you know, I should probably change that to it's a part of the normal Christian life. So if you're sitting here and you're a Christian and you're a sheep, but you're in wolf's clothing so that nobody knows you're a Christian, you know, an undercover, I'm, I, I'm, I'm an undercover agent. I'm, uh, I work for MI6 or the CIA or something like that, and people don't know who I am. Um, you, you might not suffer because the world thinks you're one of them. But if you're a normal Christian and you're identifying yourself with Jesus Christ and his principles, guess what's going to happen to you? Suffering. This reproach suffering. Uh, you might not be hung from a tree, but you will be thought strange, and it's, kind of, it's a normal part. So that, that's important. Uh, turn with me, if you would, to John chapter 15. And Jesus makes this point, and he makes it in more than one place uh, to prepare his disciples 
for what is going to happen to them. And just a few verses here in John 15, 18, Jesus says, If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. And by the way, that if is, it will. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. And so uh, Jesus is preparing his disciples for what is to come. And, uh, uh, and I don't care who you are, uh, there is something that is, uh, how, how can I say, gratifying to the flesh when people think well of you in any sphere. But Jesus said, listen, if you follow me, the world hated me, they're going to hate you. And he's preparing them. Peter, of all people, would have understood this principle like no one else. Do you remember Peter? Peter knows what he's talking about when he writes this. Peter is the one who the night before Jesus was crucified and he was going through these bogus trials in the middle of the night, Peter, while all the disciples desert Jesus, Peter is hanging around outside and he's warming himself with others around a campfire. And somebody says, hey, aren't you one of those Jesus people? No, Peter said, not me. I don't know the guy. And uh, three times he's questioned about it. And, uh, and of course, Jesus predicted that and the rooster crowed. And, uh, and Peter left and was just, humiliated in himself that he denied his Savior. He succumbed to the pressure. And when you stop and you think of the pressure uh, that he was under, nobody had a gun to Peter's head. All they said was, in a uh, kind of a derogatory way, hey, aren't you a friend of that guy? I saw you hanging around with him. Did you hang around with him? I saw you, and Peter, oh, no, 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 not me, not me. And now Peter is telling us, you know what? And after Jesus warns them, and John records that for us, what we just read in John chapter 15, and, and it's interesting that John would remember this. Did you know that the Gospel of John was one of the last books in the Bible to be written. Um, Revelation was written after John. John wrote this as a very old man in A.D. 85. Paul is dead. Jerusalem has already been conquered. And John writes the Gospel of John. And he remembers. Of course, the Holy Spirit. He had a little help from the Holy Spirit. But he remembers what Jesus warned them about. And it was about this. Well, let's, uh, let, let's move on. He says, you're not to be surprised by it. And the idea there is don't be uh, afraid of the reproach that's coming. Uh, don't be uh, taken off guard. Oh, I didn't know this was happening. Whoa. Uh, are, you, are, are, are you sure? Um, that point is not there. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, the Apostle Paul has some words for, uh, for Timothy in uh, regard to that. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 10, we read, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, longsuffering, charity, and patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, 
what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will, now get this, live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And uh, the Apostle Paul is warning Timothy of that. And here Peter is warning these uh, at least five churches that he wrote uh, this general epistle to. Well, let's move on. He, he has this to say as we uh, uh, look on in verse 12. Uh, he calls it the fiery trial. And as we think of a fiery trial, uh, the idea is, is uh, you know, burning metal, uh, the, uh, the torch, the smelting process where the dross is, is uh, come to the top and it's skimmed off, leaving the pure stuff. Uh, these trials help purify us. They serve a purpose. And so as, as we stop and we think of the purpose that is being served, uh, you know, it should actually cause us to be a little more thankful, isn't it? That people have recognized that there is a difference between Jesus Christ and his righteousness and the way the world lives. And guess what? They're seeing that difference in me. Wow. That's amazing. Most of the time, the world looks at us, they couldn't tell the difference. And I've been guilty of that. Oh, I didn't know you were a, you were a Christian. I mean, you're a pastor? I didn't know that. Oh, don't tell anyone. <laughs> this suffering leads to a deeper fellowship. Let's read on. Um, in verse 13, but rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings. That's the very same thing that Paul uh, just warned uh, Timothy about or, or told Timothy, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding uh, joy. And here we are. We are partakers uh, with Christ. Um, reading on. This leads to blessing. And as we think of this joy that we have, let's look at verse 14. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. And that little word happy right there um, really should be blessed. And some of your translations probably have that word blessing uh, there. Uh, the word happy is an interesting term. Uh, we find it uh, uh, in our uh, preamble, you know, the pursuit of happiness. Uh, what is happiness all about? And when we think of happy, you know, happy, 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 some, you know, lightweight, so, uh, you know, uh, uh, word that, uh, you know, seems kind of a frivolous word, doesn't it? Happy, happy, happy. And uh, yet we've all used it in... Uh, in ways, uh, if you've done a job and it turns out, have you ever said, you know, I'm happy with the way that turned out? And uh, if you uh, uh, bought something and it doesn't work the way it's supposed to be, what do you say? Well, I'm not happy with this. And as we stop and we think of, of this happiness, uh, there's with that the idea of a, a fulfilled spirit, a blessed spirit. And, and as we go through this and we see the results of this, uh, we can be blessed uh, right in the middle of the reproach of Christ because who are we associated with? We're associated with Jesus Christ. Well, uh, as we go on and we look at this passage, we are reminded what not to suffer for. And it, it's amazing that this is actually the second time Peter's mentioned this, and he's mentioned it in more detail here than he did before. If you just turn back to uh, a page to chapter 2, verse 20, uh, he read this, For what glory is it if when ye are buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? And uh, oftentimes we suffer just because we're boneheads. And now Peter says this, let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief 
or as an evil doer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. And a busybody there is someone, uh, if you look up the word, it's the idea of, of uh, knowing how to run someone else's life better than they know. Because I know how to run your life. So I'm going to poke my nose in your business. And you know what? Oftentimes, uh, we can get our nose chopped off when that happens. And Peter says, don't suffer for that. In fact, uh, to tell you the truth, uh, most of us can't even run our own lives. And if, if uh, we had to run somebody else's life, uh, we're, we're, we're going to drown. So, uh, you know, get, get, get your own house in order. Uh, that's, uh, that's, that's a biblical principle, by the way. Uh, let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief. And I actually know criminals or know of criminals, I'll put it this way, who were part of the cloth. And they ended up in jail. And you know what they said? This is how blind people can get. Well, God wanted me here, so he put me in jail, so I can be this tremendous testimony in jail. Well, listen, if you end up in jail, you could be a testimony in jail. We should be a testimony wherever we're at. But listen, that is not a good way, a good missionary plan. We'll put it this way. You don't go out and commit crimes and get thrown in jail so that you can witness to, to prisoners. In fact, most jails, if you want to witness to prisoners, you don't have to be a criminal to do it. You might need a security check. And you know what? As a Christian, you should be able to pass that. Verse 16, let's go on. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, and that's interesting, that word Christian right there. You know, this word Christian is used uh, three times in the, uh, in the New Testament, twice in the book of Acts. In fact, uh, the last time in the book of Acts was that King Agrippa said, uh, Paul, you've almost persuaded me to become a Christian. And this term was actually uh, uh, started off as a derogatory term. I mean, it, it's one of those Christ people. You're one of those Christ ones. And, and, and that's, that's the context that it was used. And it's just kind of been co-opted into uh, this term where today, uh, you know, if, if you're not a Buddhist, a Hindu, or a Muslim you're a Christian. And uh, if you join the military, what are you? A, a Jew, Christian, or what? And uh, so you check the box, Christian. Why? Because I'm none of the rest. Well, that's not what a true Christian is. A true Christian is one who Christ is in. Who A Christian is one who has trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And I'll tell you what, there's a lot of people in this country who call themselves Christian who have no idea what the word actually means or entails. And uh, Peter is using this right here because it's the world that doesn't like you. And this is their derogatory term for you. So if you suffer for a Christian... Let him not be ashamed. Doesn't that sound like the Apostle Paul in our scripture reading this morning? I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's because of the gospel that suffering took place. And when you share the gospel, there are people who balk and fight. And uh, uh, how, how, how can I put it? It's, uh, uh, oh, this is, uh, this is, uh, pretty interesting, uh, this passage right here, suffering as a Christian. Don't be ashamed. Uh, and we should glorify God uh, as part of it. And that's the end of verse uh, uh, 14 and the end of verse 16. But let him glorify God because of this, on this behalf. And then uh, he goes on. And he says this in verse uh, 
17, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Now, as we, we won't take the time to look up these verses in Isaiah, but in Isaiah, uh, it's talked about punishing Israel's enemies. And in this verse, it says God is going to take care of Israel first. And then he's going to turn to the enemies. And what we find is a principle in God's word that God deals with his children first. And so as we think of discipline, uh, discipline, God isn't interested right now in disciplining and shaping up the lives of the devil's children. They're his family. When you become a member of God's family, through faith in Christ alone, then you have a new father who is very much interested in your proper development. And if necessary, he will take you to the woodshed. And he does that throughout our lifetime. In fact, the book of Hebrews tells us that uh, that's one of the signs of being a child of God, that you've been taken to the woodshed. In fact, if you've never been taken to the woodshed, are you sure you're a child of God? Because we all need it. And God deals with us first. And he deals with us very graciously. His point in our sin has already been punished on the cross. When God disciplines you, it's not to punish you. It is to correct you and to get you pointed in the right direction. That's why uh, in the communion passage, it says, judge yourself so you won't be judged. In other words, do your own self-examination, get straightened out so God won't have to, through discipline, straighten you out. But if you won't, he will. And, uh, and that's his purpose. You say, well, doesn't God have to punish me? Uh, no. There, did, did you know that in grace there is no place for penance? Did you know that? That Jesus Christ took all of our penance and he did it for us. Uh, verse 18, uh, we just read it. And let me just go back to 2 Timothy and take a look at just a couple of pages uh, to your left. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, uh, we read this. For the which cause I also suffer these things. And look what he says. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. And as we uh, finish this uh, chapter, Look at verse 19. Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing. He's not talking about salvation here. He is talking about the fact that I can't take it anymore and I'm just turning into a bundle of nerves. And he says, you don't have to be a bundle of nerves. Commit yourself to the Lord. He can see us through all of these troubles. And this lines up with what we just read in our scripture reading this morning. I know whom I have believed. This is very Pauline. And I've committed myself to him no matter what I go through. You know what? He is in control and he will see me through. And guess what? I can sleep tonight. I can sleep tonight knowing uh, this right here and uh, keeping the souls in him in well-doing is unto a faithful uh, creator. Well, let's pause for prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you again for your grace. And we think of 
of these uh, admonitions, of these reminders, of these warnings and cautions that as we live the Christian life, as we grow more like Jesus Christ, that the distinction will get bigger and bigger. And as we also see the world moving further and further away from any biblical principles, this chasm is widening. And what it means for your children is the reproach of Christ is going to be a very real thing. And we pray that as your children, we would not be surprised, we would not get knocked off our pins, that we could be of sound mind and give you the glory and allow uh, your work in us to complete us and to mature us and make us even more like Jesus Christ. And we thank you that when the judgment day comes, that we will hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. We pray that that would be true of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's... And let me close with Paul's verse that we just read. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Thank you for coming, and have a good day. You're dismissed.